Hello everyone and welcome to Geotab Online Training. Thanks for joining us today for Tuesday's talk. We are going to pass it over to Vic who's going to give us a little sneak preview as to what's coming for uh, Geotab Drive. So uh, yeah, I mean as, as Carrie mentioned, uh, we're going to be coming out with the new Geotab Drive 4.0 is going to be the version number update. Uh, we were initially aiming for June 30th. I think it's going to be early next week, so it might be a few days later. But uh, basically, uh, we're going to be coming out with this new app version. It is going to be a major update, and that's why I wanted to uh, to have this Tuesday talk with everybody to uh, ensure everybody is aware of how uh, this this new app version is going to work and what the uh, new features are that are included. So there's actually uh, several new features, which, which I'll go through in a little bit. Uh, myself and my team, we're busy uh, working towards ELD compliancy today. So, I mean, we've had a few presentations on what an ELD is. There is a huge uh, document from the FMCSA that describes the technical specifications. We are working through those tech specs today. Uh, there are some aspects of the mandate that we're still waiting on from the FMCSA different protocols around the transfer methods at a roadside inspection. And the FMCSA still needs to reveal how the system is going to look like, what are the technical specs surrounding it. So uh, it is a little bit of a weight game in that although we might finish uh, everything else within that ELD document, uh, there are still unknowns from the FMCSA that we're waiting on. Now, uh, before I get started on these new features that have been added in, I do want to let everybody know that uh, we are going to be sending a letter out. This letter is signed by our CEO, Neil Kuss, and uh, it's a commitment from Geotab that we are going to be ELD certified, and we are committed uh, both to our current customers as well as any potential customers to be ELD compliant before the required dates. Currently, as we stand today, our device is an AOBRD, an automatic onboard recording device, uh, which is compliant, and it will be compliant all the way through until December 2019. Uh, that being said, we obviously want to get through uh, these tech specs, and uh, hopefully the FMCSA releases their part, and uh, get everything aligned, QA tested, and up on the FMCSA website before the required dates. That document that you see on the right side is just a preview. We are going to be sending this letter out uh, in the immediate future, and it will be posted up on my admin as well. So uh, what you see in front of you, it's on our test server. This is what the latest release of my Geotab is going to look like. So I understand the June release is currently rolling out, and uh, really uh, the new Geotab drive version, so 4.0, and the my Geotab release, which will be June, uh, are going to be closely tied, and that's why I'm going to be showing you guys a little bit of both. Within Geotab Drive, uh, we're, we have many new features such as personal conveyance, so I know that's been something that's been on the to-do list for some time. We were waiting on the FMCSA to come out with their specs, and then now we've finally uh, put it into this new app release. There's going to be yard moves. There's going to be weight at well, so that's for uh, any uh, oil well service drivers. There's uh, the salesperson exemption, so if you have any drivers that uh, meet the criteria for a salesperson, they can now select this within the rule set options. There's a new improved DVIR workflow. So we've made it a little bit more user intuitive. There's uh, more messages and it's just a lot more neater than what's out there today. Also, we have the compliance report built into the Geotab Drive app. So what that is, is it's a dedicated roadside inspection report that a driver would click on and hand over to the officer. I know in uh, the version that's out there today, there's you know a bunch of different menus. There's the graph, there's the logs. Now we have one dedicated page. And I'll be showing you what that looks like. And then uh, at the very end of my presentation, I'll be talking about Geotab Drive 4.0. There's actually going to be a new release structure. We've actually changed the architecture of the app, and I'll be explaining how that's going to work. Let's get started on some of these uh, exemptions that I mentioned. What the mandate states is that these exemptions aren't going to be allowed by default. It's actually something that your carrier would actually have to go in and configure for you to start using these exemptions. So the way to do that is uh, you would go into the driver's user page. So for instance, I've got Ethan Driver here as my driver account. If I navigate over to the options menu and scroll down to the bottom, so I mean you guys are probably familiar with this, there's now a whole bunch of different options under hours of service settings. 
So there's the rule set followed by the user, and I can click this, and I'll see all my various rule sets. And under here, I'll see USA salesperson. And that's how you would configure your driver to be a salesperson and use that exemption. You might see Texas down here. This is actually going to be part of our July release, so it's not going to be into June, but uh, it's coming fairly soon. Down below over here, we have the oil transport exemption, so this was for drivers who transported material to an oil site. Now we have the oil well exemption, so these are drivers who are actually servicing oil wells. And there's something called wait time, and uh, that's what this exemption allows you to do. Down below over here, we have our home terminal address and carrier number, so we've had that for some time. But just below that, you'll see your uh, yard move allowed and personal conveyance allowed. And this is where you would give the driver these options. So I'm going to go ahead over here and head on and on. There's the uh, driver license number and state, which has to be filled out as well as per the ELD mandate. Uh, I might as well hit this one on as well. And let's hit save. Okay, so now this driver is actually configured to use these exemptions. I can go into GeoTab Drive, and I'm just going to do a quick check for updates just to synchronize with the server. And now if I go back to HOS, there's now a new menu option over here. So previously we had status, graph, logs, and verify. Now we have an options button within here. I go over to options and I'm now allowed these various exemptions. So we've got the adverse driving condition which we've had uh, for some time, but then now you see yard move and personal use down here. There's also oil well wait time down here. As I scroll down on this page, you'll see down below over here it says compliance report and there's a generate button. This is what the driver would actually show a DOT officer during a roadside inspection. So uh, let's go ahead and try that out. So if I go ahead and hit Generate, it gives me a dedicated page with a header which has some standard information. And as I scroll down below, you'll see the graph and you'll see the logs all on one dedicated page. There's the date, the time, type, uh, the location, origin, odometer, etc. And it's all on one page. Now, I know in the past uh, we've had questions where um, Within GeoTab Drive, we show violations. So if the driver did drive in violation, it would actually show up on the logs page. You can see that on this dedicated page, it simply shows you only the logs and nothing else. I mean, for the driver himself or herself, they'll be able to see if they ever drove in violation and things like that under the logs page. But for the officer, all that's required is truly the raw data. And that's shown within here. If I go back to my options page, so let's say I'm a driver and I'm now going to perform a yard move. What a yard move is, if I'm in my company yard and I simply need to move the vehicle from one location to another, what the FMCSE allows is you can actually hit the yard move button and start to drive. And the application will actually not switch you over to a driving status. It'll actually keep you in an on-duty, not driving status, and that's to save on drive time. It's a special exemption that's allowed, so I'm going to go ahead and hit start, and it asks you, why are you using this exemption? And I would simply type in, you know, need to move vehicle within yard, and hit apply. And now if I go over to my status, you'll see that on duty is selected automatically, and it'll say you are currently in a yard move exemption. Uh, now if I were to start driving, the app will not switch me over to a driving status. So that's the benefit of the yard move. What personal conveyance states is if I need to use this vehicle for my own personal use, I can actually uh, go ahead over here. So let's say I'm done doing the yard move, I would hit stop. And let's say I'm now going to start using this in a personal conveyance status. I would hit start over here. Again, I need to make an annotation indicating why. So I could say something like need to go to the grocery store, hit apply, and now when I start driving, it'll actually keep me in an off-duty status, and it will not switch me over to driving when I start moving the vehicle. And again, that's to uh, save on drive time and things like that. We are still recording the odometer readings, um, the engine hours at these various special statuses, 
So although I'm in a personal use exemption, I'm still recording all that mileage. So if a driver is abusing it, the officer can tell, right? So I mean, it's not it's not meant for a driver to select a personal use and drive a hundred miles. It's simply to go down the street during his off duty time. Again, uh, if once I'm done my personal use, I would just simply go in here and hit stop. And then now, if I go back over to status, I have my various options once again. Under the logs page, depending on which uh, special exemption I chose, it'll show YM indicating yard move or PC indicating personal conveyance. Now, the other uh, improvement that, that was, uh, that's going to be within the GeoTab Drive 4.0 update is DVIR. The workflow itself is the same. All we've added within here is more messages and we've made the workflow more intuitive. So uh, this is going to be the workflow. So the driver comes in. He's going to see the date and time at which the previous inspection was done. And he's going to basically click this. He's going to review the previous inspection, ensure that everything looks OK. If there were any repairs made, things like that, he would review that. And then he's going to go in here and hit certify previous inspection. And this is basically signing off on the previous inspection, indicating that, yes, I've read it. So the driver clicks that. And then now it prompts him to do a new inspection. So I mean, both these steps should be done together. So you review the previous report, sign off on it, and then you do a new report. So I would basically come in here, and uh, let's say I have a problem. I've uncovered it, and there's a problem with the brakes. And I've noticed that it's actually weak or ineffective. I would simply hit the Done button here and scroll down to the bottom. And it's going to ask me to sign off on the DVIR report. I say, yes, I've inspected this. And now there's a message that says, inspection complete. There's a message over here indicating that this vehicle needs a repair. So uh, once a technician has actually looked into it and has performed the repair, either the technician can log in or the driver can come in and say, you know, repair made, and simply hit this button. It's now going to say a repair has been logged, and there's a message over here indicating that a repair has been completed on this vehicle. Now, the next driver would come in, inspect, ensure uh, that the repair has indeed been made, and everything looks okay. If everything looks good, he's going to hit safe to operate, and then do a new inspection. If everything now looks okay, there's no other defects, he's going to come in here and hit done. And that's it. The inspection is complete. So, I mean, this is the workflow, right? So the idea is you come in, you review the previous inspection, sign off on it, do your new inspection, sign off on this one, and that's it. You're completed. So this is the DVIR workflow. We now have a check mark saying inspection complete. So it's a lot more intuitive to the driver to uh, know exactly when the inspection is completed. The overall uh, look and feel of the app is, is the same. These are the new options that are available. Again, this has to be pre-configured, so you need to go in here on the users page, go into options, and actually allow the driver these options. So, I mean, if you're a company who has company trucks and personal conveyance isn't something that's used by your drivers, you would probably want to leave this off, right? So it all has to be configured by the carrier, and once the driver has allowed these options, the driver will now see this within the app. So that covers uh, personal conveyance, yard moves, weighted wealth, salesperson exemption, and the improved DVIR workflow. Nick, we actually have a question. If, um, if you could maybe demonstrate the weighted well, because I know you, you did the yard move and personal use. Oh, I'm not yes. sure if the weighted well is different. OK, my apologies. Yep, so the weighted well <laughs> is, uh, is, is the exact same. So I mean, all three of these, the structure is the same. I'm going to go in here and hit Start. And it gives me the stop button over here to indicate when I'm done. If I go over to the status page, it shows me in an off-duty status, because that's what's allowed in a weighted well exemption. And uh, if I go over to my graph, uh, it'll show me in an off-duty status over here. And if I go over to the logs page, it'll basically show this as WT, indicating wait time. Now, there are some rules built into this. Uh, for instance, the wait time actually extends the 14-hour window and things like that. And that's all built in into the rules engine. 
So my uh, status page will reflect that and will take that into consideration. Okay, so um, now the last topic I wanted to go over with everybody is the new GeoTab Drive 4.0 release structure. We've actually, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, changed the architecture a little bit. The reason why is, I mean, we're bringing all these new features in rapidly. Every month uh, we're, we're going to be coming out with a new app version, and what we're seeing is um, it's a little bit hard to manage from a, a carrier perspective or a customer perspective. So what we've done with the uh, latest release, so 4.0, is we've actually come out with a new shell container approach. What this is, is the uh, much like my GeoTab, when we do uh, my GeoTab updates overnight, so let's say uh, you come into work one day, uh, you'll now all of a sudden see these new features, right? So everything happens instantaneously. You are updated to the latest version at all times. We're going to take a similar approach to GeoTab Drive. So GeoTab Drive is a web application. It's an offline web application, so it does work offline, so even if you're going in and out of coverage. Now, if we do a release online on my GeoTab, GeoTab Drive is actually going to pick up on that and actually download the app version instantaneously. So what that means is uh, there's the amount of app updates that we're going to be coming out with on the Play Store or the Apple iOS Store is actually going to be changing. You're not going to see releases very often at all. Instead, what we're going to be doing is 4.0 is going to be a shell application that's downloaded. Now, depending on the My Geotab server you're on, you're going to see Geotab Drive updates come in when we update that server. So it's going to be managed exactly in the same release cycle as my GeoTab. So uh, with this new 4.0 release, one thing I want to throw out there is it is going to be bigger than your usual GeoTab drive release. Typically a GeoTab uh, drive release is about one or two megabytes, whereas GeoTab drive 4.0 is going to be 23 megabytes roughly. So once that 23 megabyte download is completed, the actual app update that's downloaded from the server is very minimal. I mean, that's going to be really small. And going forward, the advantage with this is you're going to be using up less data because the amount of updates you're actually downloading are truly updates. So it's not, you're not downloading the actual framework. You're not downloading the whole app version every time. When we do a My Geotab update, it simply picks up on those changes and just downloads only those changes specifically down to the app. Some of those questions you might encounter when uh, you put in a support ticket, where our engineers ask you, hey, are, are you sure you're actually um, on GeoTab Drive 3.1.27? If not, can you update? And then you've got to go chase down your driver or your manager and follow up on that. So there's a lot of difficulty around that, and that's why we're coming out with this new approach. With this new approach, it also lets us come out with updates faster. So if there are any issues and things like that, we can instantaneously push out an update and everybody will receive that update without any user intervention. When an update occurs, we will still be storing all that data on the device. So there's going to be no loss of data and uh, we'll only be doing updates um, you know, after hours anyway. So um, there really is no risk with this. Um, there are only a ton of benefits. and it really gives you a lot more flexibility now in that you can set up your apps to only update over Wi-Fi and things like that and uh, it's not going to be as critical anymore that you always have the latest version off the Play Store. Once you download 4.0, that's really it. After that, it's, it's all up on GeoTab really. Our engineers update the My GeoTab server and then the Drive app will just reflect those changes. I just, again, want to emphasize the uh, file size. So, I mean, this is going to be a larger update. It is going to be 23 megabytes roughly, so uh, you might want to let your customers know to uh, try to update over Wi-Fi, especially if uh, they have a small data plan. All right, excellent. Okay, so I, I have a couple of questions. One is, currently, when we go to demo the app, we are using the database name slash d slash 2. Is that going to change? It is, yep. So what's going to happen is, I mean, once once you get the June release of my GeoTab. Uh, if you go to my.geotab.com/d/2, it will automatically redirect you 
over to my.geotab.com slash drive. So that's, going so that's going to be the new URL. So uh, going forward, I mean, we'll update all our documentation, but going forward to demo the app on the browser, it'll be my.geotab.com slash drive. And is that including the database name in there, or is that automatic? No, it's just, it's just, just slash drive, no database name needed. Okay, all right, excellent, okay. So we have a few other questions here. Actually, we have a whole bunch of questions here, so let's see if we can get through these. Does weight at the well work similarly to the yard move? Now, we saw the sample of that, and I would say basically it does work the same in that you're going through the same process to get to it. Is there anything on the roadmap to remind drivers to do their DVIR? Driver logs in. Uh, it's going to prompt the driver to select the vehicle, the trailer, and then it's actually going to prompt the driver to do a DVIR. Um, so that'll be a pre-trip inspection, and then uh, when the driver logs out of the app, it'll ask the driver to perform another DVIR, and then verify logs, and then, you know, select their status before they log out. All right, excellent. Next question would be, and I'm not positive of the outcome of this one, how would an inspector get access to the DVIR logs? Now, by requirement, they only need to have access to the last one. Is that correct? Correct, yeah. So uh, it would be simply, you would just go over to the DVIR page and just show the officer this right here. All right, excellent, thank you. Lots of questions here on little things that are going to come up as we kind of go along, so I'm going to comment on one of them here. If a driver is on a 30-minute break, then decides to move the vehicle and switch to personal use to drive across the street for a soda, would that cause the driver's break time to start over again? Now, they're already off-duty, and they would flip to personal conveyance. So would that change anything in that workflow, or would it still remain the same, because your personal conveyance keeps them off duty? Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. This might be something, uh, you know, we might just need to take offline just to review the regs carefully, but uh, I, don't, I don't think so offhand. How much data will average an iPad or a smartphone or an iPhone or whatever the case may be, um, will we need? per month for the drive app every week and I or, or every month is really what it is and I say that because it's been asked many times before but where are we at with that and what kind of what's the suggestion that we say to put on so I mean I always recommend 65 megabytes per month that is the average use I mean uh, it all depends on how you use the app if you if you're not using the app much uh, you might see that number go down if you're using the app a lot, I mean, this 65 megabytes was based on one of our heaviest customers for hours of service. And this is across a large fleet, and that's the average. So I would say 65 megabytes per month is the number you're looking at. So just plan appropriately so that it's slightly higher than that number, but that, that should suffice. So in that case, would you say that that is the maximum, not the average? Correct, yep. So uh, for a regular fleet, um, 65 megabytes would be the maximum. Excellent. Okay, thank you. One more question, because it doesn't exist to date. The rule name that sits in compliance print is not there. Is that something that we're looking at to add? Because I know it's been asked by a few people before. So uh, by that question, so let's just navigate over to that page. Uh, I, part of the ELD mandate is, I mean, I get this question a lot, right? All these errors of service limits and things like that, like that's not mandated at all. So I mean, a driver could be in a 60-hour, 70 rule set, but uh, the ELD doesn't need to tell the driver, hey, you only have five hours and 35 minutes left. All the FMCSA requires is that you log all this electronically. So the driver can manage all this stuff on his own. All they want to see is that all of this is electronically logged. So when you start driving, does the vehicle switch over to drive automatically? Things like that. So, I mean, under the uh, options page, uh, I think this is what the question is about. If I go over to generate, there's not a rule set within here, and that's because it's not actually required. The FMCSA is pretty clear that um, all these fields are the only fields that are actually required. They don't want any additional fields, and there's a whole set of requirements around, you know, the way that this report ha has to be transferred over to them electronically. That being said, on the uh, My Geotab interface, uh, so on this portal over here, we do display on our, our compliance print the uh, rule set that the driver's in. So from an administrative perspective, that's where you can find that information. Okay, excellent, thank you. All right, can you clarify the HOS compliance being connected, for example, Bluetooth connected compliant? This is a question that's come up as far as the new regs go 
which way are we going? Are we doing Bluetooth or are we doing the other options? And you kind of just spoke into that as to how they are going to get that information that's, that makes us compliant. Sure. I mean, that's a great question. So, I mean, this question comes up a lot. What the FMCSA requires is that you synchronize with the engine on the vehicle. Are you getting engine speed off of the vehicle? Are you getting VIN off of the vehicle? Um, things like that. How you get that information is truly up to you. So uh, to answer that specific question, Bluetooth would definitely be compliant. Any wireless uh, method would be compliant. The bottom line is you have to get that information off of the engine somehow and display it on, on the tablet or the smart device or any other display unit for that matter, as long as you get that off of the engine. Okay, so speaking into that a little bit more personally and from a Geotab's perspective, will we be doing a Bluetooth or a different option? So we're not going to be going down Bluetooth. Um, so there's two things, right? The way that you get it off of the engine, so we are going to be using a wireless method to uh, actually get that information off of the Go device. The uh, other term for Bluetooth that's, that's being thrown around a lot is the roadside inspection, right? So from your tablet or your smart device, you have to somehow get that information over to a DOT officer. And uh, Bluetooth is an option. Geotab is, is not going to be going down that path. There's actually four options, right? So there's wireless web services, email. So that's one option, right? So you can use both of those methods. Or you can use uh, Bluetooth and USB 2.0. So that's the other option. We're going to be going with option number one, which is going to be wireless web services and email to transfer that over to a DOT officer. Excellent. Okay. Thank you so much. That, that, that's a question that comes up all the time. So something that comes up often and that is, are we going to have videos for training purposes and so on? And yes, Vic and I are working towards that. Once we get these things ironed out and they're not changing anymore at this point, we have to wait till we're ELD compliant as the new regulations have rolled out or else we redo videos we could be weekly at this point. Um, we will try and update the documentation as often as possible and I think it's important to note that again until this is part of regulation and totally compliant things are going to change. I'll let Vic speak into that a little more. We are constantly updating our documentation. We're going to be coming out with a new uh, driver instruction guide so that's going to be uh, what um, you need to ca keep in your cab at all times as a driver uh, for compliance sake. So uh, this is the uh, instruction guide you would hand over to an officer to explain uh, how to navigate through the system. So we're going to be coming out with a new driver instruction guide that's going to show the officer how to get to this page right here because this is what the officer would want to see. So we're coming out with that shortly and it will be out by the time Geotab Drive 4.0 rolls around. Uh, there's going to be a DVIR instruction guide that, that we're working on. Release date is also going to be around the 4.0 release. And then uh, there's the system operation guide, which you can find on my admin. Uh, I'm actually working on updating that right now. And that's going to include all this information I spoke about today and how to use personal conveyance, yard moves, um, wait well time, things like that. And that's all going to be part of that uh, system operation guide, which you'll be seeing coming out soon. Excellent. Okay, so a couple of other questions here. One of the questions being, and I think I can answer this one easily, is the stickers that sit outside the cab that said this is powered by Geotab, it's e-logs powered by Geotab. Yes, we have those. They're certainly an item that can be ordered on my admin. They're an XXX item, and we can kind of go through that as we roll out. We will try and stay in tune here in Tuesday's talk to keep you up to date as to what's going on with the ELD mandates because they are constantly changing. If you have any questions with the ELD mandates as they're coming out, please don't hesitate to ask. We want to be a part of it to make it successful for you. We will get involved whenever you need us. As you're rolling this out, please ensure that you are training up not only the driver, please ensure that you are also, also so important, training the people to sit behind the desk as to how to get those logs out, how to do those compliant prints, how to edit a log. We've had lots of calls on these things, so I know that that's not all happening. If you could please ensure that that part is there. If you need help to get these things rolled out to start so you're comfortable with it, reach out to us. That's what we're here for. We want to help you because you're our arm to make this successful. With that being said, thank you so much. Join us again. I think we're going to take a, a little bit of a reprieve here as far as our Tuesday's talk go through the summer. You may find an update. Something may come out if a new partner arises or if we have a big new change on uh, hours of service that Vic wants to share with us. But otherwise, we will definitely be up 
in September up and running and have lots of updates for events. Have a great day, everyone, and we'll see you next time.